you. Most most of you listening to this talk probably think I've been in Tyndall forever. That's not quite true. I've only been here for 20 years. And when I first arrived, one of the people who already had been in Tyndall forever was Kean. So Kean has been really a key person in Tyndall over the last um, at least 30 years of like, does it go back further, Kean? But at least yes, 30. I'm, a, I'm afraid so. It, um, it's now 40 years. Well, congratulations. And Kean, when I arrived, was leading um, work in the microsystems area. But over the last 27 years, as you've seen in publicity, he's also been leading work on trying to miniaturize magnetics. Um, and uh, as the paper, as the Business Post said at the weekend, he has become an overnight success in the last few months of this work. But this really is a major area of research that Kean has led, but has involved also a very large team of people who've worked very much at, at putting together what has happened. Um, I'm not going to mention any names in the team because to mention one would be to do down the work of others and to pick one rather than the other would not be appropriate. But I think you can see some of the recognition within Tyndall of what Kean has done, both for the fact that we have 87 participants here at the moment, which is a very high number for a Tyndall talk. And also very pleased to see that there's quite a number of people who've come from external. Um, so welcome Anita, for instance, who is VP for research during a lot of the time that Keen was to carry out this work. Welcome also, I saw Pat Kelly there, who was another one of the long-standing Tyndall people who arrived, but has now moved on, I think nearly 20 years ago now to other things. Um, but still an interest to come back and see what's happening today. So uh, welcome to everybody. Um, this work, as you know, has been building for a long time, has really had a significant impact over the last number of years and hopefully this impact will only grow in the next while. So having set you up, Kian, sorry I haven't been able to say anything in there. I hope that wound you up too much. Um, I might try and do one at the end of the talk, but um, looking forward, Kian, to hear your overview on magic. Very good. Thanks very much, all. Thanks, thanks Guanan, uh, for organizing this, and Katie uh, for um, pulling it all together. Uh, can, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yes. So, um, so you'll you many. Thanks everyone for coming along, and you'll have seen um, a lot of publicity um, over the last number of weeks in relation to to the work that I'm going to talk about. Um, I was very surprised on my LinkedIn. I ended up with thirteen and a half thousand views of of the story. Normally, I'd get about fifty. Um, and of course, the most pleasing thing was that I ended up in the Corkman. And for those of you who wouldn't be familiar with the Corkman, it would be uh, a West Cork newspaper, which um, would have all the local gossip. So I'm now part of the local gossip um, out in McCroom. So um, you're, you'll be aware of, of the, the awards that, that we have um, received in the last uh, while. And I guess, you know, while my name is, is written on at least one of those awards, I really have accepted these awards um, on behalf of everybody um, in Tyndall, UCC, and even outside um, who have contributed um, to the development of this technology over, as I've already said, and Owen has said, a 27 year period was mentioned in the business post that it's older than my, my three um, children um, and possibly has caused me more trouble than them, although it's, it's debatable. So the important thing about the, um, the, the magnetics on silicon is what, what we have done is we have taken a very large bulky component, which is really important in terms of delivering the appropriate power to a microprocessor. Um, and it sits between the battery and typical microprocessor. And we've taken a very bulky component, take up a lot of space, and effectively made it disappear onto silicon. And you could compare this with what Gordon Moore did with uh, what was referred to as Moore's Law, which over 50 years ago, where he basically made the transistor 
disappear onto silicon, hence creating the, the whole microelectronics era, which is driving almost everything that we do now in terms of electronics and uh, building intelligence into a whole range of different items in the home, um, in our cars, um, in our phones, etc. But what we've managed to do over the last uh, number of years uh, is to engage with very large companies who have licensed our technology um, and they've licensed it way back 2015 but and also 2018 um, but we now believe that um, there's actually going to be the technology is going to be used in in product um, which will be released um, in in the, the 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 coming while and and i guess you know you get the best of both worlds you get the awards which represents the, the work we have done from a, a research point of view, but then you get the, the impact side, which is equally important and, and really important for what we are doing in, in Tyndall. So um, I always refer to um, power management system specifications. So again, if you think of, we have a battery in our phone, which is really important, and then we have all the electronics. And the power supply sits in between the two. And it's the specifications are as follows. Take up no space, cost nothing, last forever, and have zero power loss. And that, that has been the case for over maybe 50, 60 years, that the power supplies were the very last thing that any uh, electronics company would consider um, when they were building their computers. And therefore, many, many companies, power supply companies, had to work um, to get um, very low cost solutions into, their, into the products. That has actually changed now. Um, and now the semiconductor companies like the Intels of this world are looking uh, to take ownership of the power management solution in order to allow computers uh, to go faster, but also to use less energy. So here's an example um, of a, a smartphone. Um, an iPhone, you'll see um, the processor chip here. So this is the brain. This is where all of the processing is done um, in order to uh, allow us uh, interface with the internet, uh, interface with our phone calls, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, et cetera. But to, in order to drive that, we have a battery in the phone, and we also have here what's called a power management chip. But sitting around that power management chip are all of these components here, which are inductors. And I'm showing them over here on, on the um, right-hand side. They are actually very large, bulky component Typically, they're wire wound, uh, and, and they are almost a limiting factor in terms of the overall profile for our smartphones today. And what we wanted to do was to figure out how you could remove all of these inductors from the circuit board and make them disappear into this A12 processor chip. Now, it's the same for any other processor chip. Uh, um, a Google chip, um, a Samsung, a Qualcomm, Intel processor. It's the same basic problem that one is looking to solve. And so what we're trying to do then is we're, we're taking uh, a microprocessor, which could have tens of billions of transistors on it, and we want to power that particular processor. And, and normally it will take multiple voltages. <clears throat> so there are multiple voltage rails inside in that processor. And if you think about it, um, you'll hear of people talking about multi-core uh, microprocessor chips. And so you could think of these as, um, let's say in a city scape in New York, there are a number of blocks in the city and consider that each block is, is, um, needs power. So what we are doing then 
in, in the city, we would be providing one um, power line into each block. <clears throat> but actually what, the, what each block is made up of different apartments, different houses, different offices. And what you really want to be able to do is actually locally uh, deliver the, the power that's required into each individual um, owner. And so what we have want to do is to take a situation that we have here on the top left, where we have uh, different voltages being delivered into the, the cores in, in the processor. But now actually what we want to do is if we could go deliver a higher voltage from the outside and then inside in the processor, we can have voltage uh, conversion to the correct voltages required by each of the blocks, this would actually save us an, a large amount of energy. And part of the reason as well is if you look here on the top right, you'll see we talk about different workloads in order to do some work. So maybe there's different um, blocks within the microprocessor need to operate together. In, in a situation where you have the voltage uh, being introduced from outside, then you have a high, a high voltage um, being introduced and there is, there is um, power being used by each of these blocks um, while they're in, let's say, in a semi-sleep mode. And then when you want to use them to, to do some work, you turn them all on at the same voltage. But if you imagine, if we could take each of those little blocks and we turn each of them on um, separately, now we can actually control them at different voltages. And therefore, you can see, we can save an enormous amount of energy uh, across the lifetime of the, the operation of the processor. And by doing so, we're saving the battery power. So the battery power lasts longer. So instead of it lasting eight hours a day, perhaps we can get it to last up to 12 hours a day. But it will be the same thing for portable computers. And it would be the same thing when you think about microprocessors <clears throat> in servers in um, data centers. If we were able to control, locally control the, the power um, within those microprocessors, we can actually save significant energy. And here is the sort of concept you have on the left, what I would call a nano power grid on top of your silicon processor chip, so that you can control each of the circuits locally and thereby saving significant energy. So in this um, schematic, you have what would be on the top uh, left, the traditional power supply components. So you have the battery on the extreme left and you have the processor or the load on the extreme right. And in the middle, you have the power supply. It's made up of uh, electronic semiconductor switches. There is also control. And then there are capacitors, input and output capacitors. And there's this inductor that I've talked about already, this bulky component. You can make all of this, uh, the semiconductor and the control on silicon which means it's going to be very small, just like the, the processor. But the big problem is this inductor. And so what we wanted to do, and what the industry has been trying to do for more than 20 years, is create this idea of a power supply on chip. So we take all of the switches, the control, the capacitors, and the inductor, and put them on the processor. And that gives us power supply on chip. The capacitors would be, have been easier to do uh, than the inductor. The inductor has been what could be called the pain point for the industry. <clears throat> so how would we do this? How would we make the inductor small enough that it's going to fit on um, <clears throat> the microprocessor? You saw the bulky size of the component we're talking about. It's perhaps two millimeter by three millimeter in footprint and maybe two millimeter to three millimeter high. We want to get it down to less than a millimeter um, in footprint and only about 100 microns high. So the way to achieve that is actually, if we increase the frequency of operation of the power supply, which is made up of the power management chip, the capacitors and the inductor, if we can increase the frequency quite dramatically, we can reduce 
the size of the inductor and actually the capacitors that, that are needed. And so if we can operate up in the 50 to 100 megahertz range, instead of the one to five megahertz range, which is what is being used today, we can actually reduce the size of the inductor component quite dramatically so that it could actually fit on top of the processor. And many of them could fit on top of the processor. So this takes us to the idea of what we've been working on, the idea of magnetics on silicon, making magnetics disappear. So we integrate the power solution, the power management with the load, that's the microprocessor, the brain. We create what we can call a granular power grid or a nano power grid that can deliver multiple voltage rails uh, to all the cores on the processor. And the other thing that we can do is actually we can turn on and turn off each of the blocks or the cores on the processor much more quickly. And that means that you can get the, the different blocks to go to sleep and wake them up very quickly. And that would be the, that actually is the true holy grail, which is still out in front of us. But overall, the idea is you can increase system efficiency, which in the case of smartphones or portable electronics, you're able to um, increase the, the battery lifetime. So Tyndall, we have been working on this. Um, I would say we have um, invested 150 person years between researchers, PhDs, master students. I have worked out that we have had eight generations of uh, researchers working on this over 27 years. We've had 20 million euro of investment from Enterprise Ireland, Science Foundation Ireland, the EU. And what we have tried to do is we've actually taken a holistic approach to the problem. We haven't just focused on, can you solve the problem of the magnetic material? And that's, that's quite a problem in itself. But we've also looked at, once we solve the problem of the magnetic material, how could we uh, fabricate that in a, a high volume manufacturing environment? How could we combine it with other components by putting it into what would be called um, integrated circuit packages? And therefore, we looked at, at the, the um, gave a multidisciplinary approach to the problem. From a design point of view, I guess that was most important that we start with that, that we, when we're designing components, what we want to do is we want to optimize the components. And the way to do that is developing models that you, you check against measured devices and thereby validate the models so that you can actually then predict how the components might behave if you change them slightly and optimize them. High efficiency is, of course, number one and small footprint. And this multidisciplinary approach, that's the great thing about Tyndall. And many of the companies we've engaged with have said this to us. Some of them have said, you know, I've, I've asked them, you know, what are you doing here in Cork? It rains every day. And uh, I've said, why aren't you in Berkeley? Why aren't you in MIT, Harvard? And, and they've come back and they've said, well, who is better than Tyndall in this area? And they also comment on the fact that when you come into Tyndall, you don't just come in and get one expert. You get a whole team of people who have different expertise that can be pulled on as and when required. So, you know, to be able to use our electron microscopes, to be able to use our focused ion beam systems, even if it's a once-off, there's experts there who can use that and deliver it for us. So just some information here on, you know, we, we have always tried to balance what we are doing on the research side to be research excellent with what we deliver on the commercial or impact side. So there's some highlights here that at the time of um, publication of the papers, we would have had the highest efficiency micro inductors, same with our micro transformers, which we uh, worked uh, on with uh, Texas Instruments. Um, and then we would have had various other highlights along the way particular highlight would be, you know, it's not just enough that we can, we can tell people we can make magnetic components. If, if you go into a big company, a big company needs to have 
computer-aided design software in order to design their circuits. So you have to then be able to give them a, a, a computer-aided design tool in order to do that. So we also contributed in that case. And I guess, you know, most important in terms of an output from uh, an organization like Tyndall within the university is to be able to transfer graduates and staff into industry and academia. And we've been able to do that, particularly um, in Ireland in analog devices uh, but, and microchip, but also dialog semiconductors in the UK and global foundries in uh, Germany. And interesting, one of our uh, people recently joined Dupuy. I don't think he's going to be working on magnetics on silicon there, but I, I can imagine he's going to do a job in, in the whole materials area. And maybe, maybe what I should do here is I just wanted to show you here. If you look, you can get a sense of the size of the components we're talking about. Well, what are the components made up of? Well, you can see this sort of copper um, colored, orange colored uh, material. This is, uh, well, that's like copper wire, let's call it, except we can, we can deposit it in a very controlled fashion onto a silicon chip. And then you can see this, um, uh, maybe silver white area here. And what that is, that is a magnetic material. You can see the a line um, along the bottom and then it's, it's wrapping around the, the uh, copper coil. And that magnetic material gives us a higher um, performance for that inductor. <clears throat> Very important thing for Tyndall was the fact that we were able to work with uh, silicon wafers. So having a wafer fabrication facility really distinguished us from many of the other research or, um, groups in the world um, in order to be able to engage with, with companies in, in what they considered a very serious way. And then if you look at it from a commercialization point of view, this was probably really important for a number of reasons. Um, on the one hand, from the point of view of getting international commercialization for this technology and for convincing the international companies that there was an opportunity here. Um, but it actually also drove our research very much because the more that we went out to engage with companies and listen to their problems, understand the challenges they had, and, and then understand the challenges they had with our technology so that we could go back and address many of those challenges. And what we did in, or, in order to start that conversation and formalize the conversation, we organized or founded the International Workshop on Power Supply and Chip in 2008. And that was held in Cork and in 2010 again. And it was really interesting. We had about 120 people attending that. And there was 12 people from Intel in the US. So when you have 12 people from Intel, you know, I'm always looking for signals, okay? And some of the signals or you know, the thoughts would be, well, <clears throat> there's something going on in this area that's important, or they're afraid there's something going on in this area, or they just came to drink Murphy's. And it was a little bit of all of the above because what was really interesting about the work that Intel presented in those early days, it was amazing work. Uh, they were almost there with the magnetics on silicon. I would have said they were there. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, for politics reasons or business reasons or whatever, they dropped the technology completely. And so that sort of takes me to the, my cynical side, which says if a company is presenting on their technology, they, they have left it behind them and they're no longer interested in it. But that may be a little bit too cynical. This, the, the idea of being a thought leader, right, is quite interesting, you know, uh, you, be, you become somewhat of an independent facilitator, uh, where you have no axe to grind. So you can talk to all of these different companies um, under NDA in many cases, but, you know, you can almost educate them as to what the technology might do. And you can understand their problems and maybe even help them to solve some of those problems. <clears throat> And part of what we are, we're doing as well is, you know, having joined publications with 
uh, the various companies that we were working with. And what you can see here on the extreme right, um, I'm holding two wafers. I'm holding the four inch wafer that um, we, uh, we uh, build, fabricate in Tyndall, the traditional four inch wafer. And, I'm, and behind it, I'm holding a 300 millimeter or 12 inch wafer, which is what the high volume manufacturers are using. The Intels of this world, the Samsungs, they, they are building all of their chips, silicon chips on 300 millimeter wafers, 12 inch wafers. And the amazing thing about the work that we were able to do is we were able to bring a product from these 12 inch wafers into Tyndall and um, cut them up to the sizes we needed and then um, characterize them and test them and so on. And that was really important that the companies we were dealing with had the confidence to give us their product and give it, bring it into to Tyndall for processing. <clears throat> I'm just going to show you here the range of companies who would have uh, attended the power supply and chip workshop. <clears throat> and what's interesting about this, you know, if you read from the bottom up to the top, you can see a full supply chain in the area of microelectronics or semiconductors or silicon chips from the equipment suppliers, uh, the power, power um, devices, the power management chips we talked about earlier, the system on chip, which is the microprocessor, uh, discrete passive components, which are like the wire wound inductors. And then you have the, the manufacturing companies, the silicon foundries, um, who actually make much of the silicon that is made today, rather than individual um, companies make it. So now you have companies like Intel making their own silicon, Samsung, make, Samsung making their own silicon, um, and then TSMC is, and global foundries are making silicon for everybody. And then you get up to the very top here where you have the systems companies. And this is the audience that attended power supply and chip workshops. And in tw 2010, the IEEE Power Electronics Society and the Power Sources Manufacturers Association from USA, they, they asked if they could sponsor the power sock workshops going forward. And so they've taken over and it's become the flagship workshop in this space worldwide. And it has been in um, San Francisco, Boston, Madrid, Taiwan, which is really the home of semiconductor um, manufacturing um, and back in uh, University of Pennsylvania most recently. And unfortunately, I was to attend this event um, to receive the, the IEEE Power Electronics Society Award and unfortunately couldn't, so it was virtually delivered to me uh, on screen. <clears throat> Here are some examples of um, some of the inductors that we are talking about, and there's, a no there's many different groups, companies, uh, research groups have made very different versions of these components. Um, and in fact, we have engaged with most of these uh, organizations at one stage or another um, over the last 20, 25 years. If I was to make a comparison of, you know, what I, I mentioned to you that we, we use a magnetic material. So you can make an inductor without a magnetic material. We would call it air core. Uh, you'll get a very small inductance, um, but it will operate up to very, very high frequency, which is very good. <clears throat> And it's very compatible with building it on silicon. Now, if you take the conventional magnetic material, which is, is used for most inductors, it's called ferret. And it would have a, a range of um, permeabilities, which mean which allows you to get higher inductance. But it has a limited operating frequency only up to 10 megahertz. And you remember earlier I said, with the magnetics on silicon, we're interested in operating up in the 50 to 100 megahertz space. Um, the other thing that is really important is, in fact, <clears throat> the ferric core will only work um, 
up to a certain current level, at which point it, it will not, um, it, it will, let's say, it's, its material properties will collapse so that the, the permeability will go to one, like air core. And it's very limited in terms of what's called its saturation magnetization. Now, if we come to thin film, you can see we have reasonably good permeabilities to give us a good inductance value. We have the required uh, frequency of operation that we're interested in. And we actually have very high saturation magnetization. So this means we can uh, put um, a lot of current into um, these components um, and they will still operate. And the one thing about the thin film is it's compatible with um, silicon technology, which is really important. Whereas ferrite, at this moment in time, it is not compatible with um, silicon technology. And therefore, none of the companies in, this, in the semiconductor space will take up such a material. <clears throat> I just wanted to show you this, and, and this will be part of the exam later. But if you look here, the important thing about an inductor is how much energy it can store. And um, it's proportional to the saturation current. I've mentioned there earlier about the, the inductor saturating. So it's proportional to the square of the saturation current. So the saturation current is related to what's called the saturation uh, flux um, density, B sat proportional to it. So what we end up with is that the energy you can store in an inductor is proportional to the, the, the square of the saturation flux. So the higher the B set, then the higher the energy stored in the inductor. And if you remember, what we, I said to you was ferrite can only um, operate in the 0.05 to 0.1 Tesla space. And if you compare that against um, the thin film magnetic materials, which can operate in the one to 1.5 to two uh, Tesla space, you can see that we could actually store far more energy in these thin film materials. Now the thin film materials we'll use will be very thin compared with the thick ferrite materials, but it, it shows why that they are a useful material. There's one final a comparison that I wanted to make. We, we have come up with, um, let's call it a figure of merit. And um, it, it sort of, it combines the, the ACQ factor and the DCQ factor. And I won't go into the detail um, of, of the Q factors, but when you combine them together and you make a comparison between the ferrite chip inductor and the thin film inductor and the air core inductor. The thin film inductor comes out with um, a higher value. But the most important thing as well is that if you look here at the footprint area of the different inductors, right? The ferrite, one over one millimeter square, the air core over three millimeter square, whereas here, with the thin film, we can be as, as small as 0.3 millimeter square. And then if you look at the height of the inductor, the ferrite's one millimeter, the discrete air core is six millimeter in height, and the thin film inductor is only 0.2 millimeter in height. So this is where the magic comes in terms of the disappear. And of course, the other thing that's important is we talked about energy saving. So the efficiency is really important and um, here, and you can see for ferrite, 90%, um, 96 for the thin film, and 97.5 for the air core. <clears throat> and we have been able to demonstrate that 96% uh, figure. Um, here, here is just some examples of one of the inductors that we have built, and we built this in, in the silicon fabrication facility and our plating facility in Tyndall. Uh, it's a solenoid type construction. So you can see that you have these copper windings are wrapped around the magnetic core. <clears throat> uh, and 
And here are some examples again. The, the important information here is right that we wanted to be able to operate um, this inductor um, above uh, 100 megahertz, so 10 to the 8. So we have a 50 nanohenry inductor operating up above 100 nanohen, 100 megahertz. And the other thing that was important, I mentioned the Q, we were able to get a PQ of 25. Um, in the region of 20 to 30 megahertz. And at the time in 2018, in the, at the Taiwan power sock, that was the highest reported Q for these integrated um, magnetics. And if you look here, we, we're showing um, two plots that are comparing uh, different um, inductor technologies from uh, different groups around the world. Uh, so we're plotting the inductance here against what we would uh, call the inductance per um, DC resistance. And you can see here that the Tyndall data, the Tyndall device, it has low inductance, which means it can operate at very high frequencies, and it has the best um, inductance uh, per DC resistance of the different ones that we looked at. And if you look at it from a Q point of view, again, um, the PQ we had, one of the highest um, Q factors, and uh, this compared with a device that we built for uh, one of our customers. So we were able to get, uh, in two instances, uh, the highest Q that had been reported at that time. <clears throat> so I've talked to you there about magnetics on silicon um, and you know building magnetics into the silicon chip. I now want to talk to you about the if you open any uh, computer or any piece of electronics, you'll see um, the circuit board, what's called a printed circuit board. And many years ago, uh, we managed to get a patent on the idea of could you actually put those thin film magnetic materials into the printed circuit board? And so in 2005, we, we got what was our first US patent. And nobody, had any interest in it whatsoever until around uh, 2016 when we got involved in a European project. So there is nothing worse than being ahead of the game. And you could say, well, research is supposed to be ahead of the game. Yes, but you have to be really careful that you're not too far ahead of the game. I guess you could I, I'd reflect on say George Boole, Maybe in his day, it was okay to be ahead of the game and, and wait for Claude Shannon to come along and find a use for um, his uh, study or his research. Um, in, in our space, you always have to be showing that research can deliver impact. So we have got, uh, over the last four years, got involved in a project, European project, uh, with an Austrian company who make printed circuit boards. And what they uh, do is they actually embed silicon chips into their printed circuit boards. So what we wanted to do with them is see, could they add magnetic materials into their printed circuit boards? And we have been working with them over the last three or four years in terms of doing that. So this would be a cheaper way um, of um, making mag magnetic components disappear. Now they're disappearing into the uh, printed circuit board. There, there is a, a challenge here that the footprint of these particular inductors is going to be larger than what you can do on silicon. But it does have, there are applications where it can be used. <clears throat> and we, we wanted to go one step further, in fact. And what we did is we took the thin film magnetic materials that we used on silicon. So these films, they would be, <clears throat> you could imagine it's like cling film. So, and this cling film is a magnetic material. And what we did is we took that cling film and we actually got ATNS to embed that cling film as a magnetic material inside in the printed circuit board. So we got that thin film material embedded here in order to allow us to make high performance uh, magnetics similar to what we were doing in the magnetics on silicon. 
and um, the results were very, very positive. And they even did reliability testing to prove that um, the, the film would remain stable within uh, the construction. So that was, that was that's really pleasing. And we're now looking to see, can we progress that uh, technology further, uh, both in-house <clears throat> and uh, with ATNS. Um, I wanted to show you, um, I mentioned Intel being at PowerSock in, in 2008. And Intel showed their magnetics on silicon, which you can see here on the left. Um, they have their standard silicon chip with all of the different interconnection layers. And then sitting on top, they have the magnetic materials, um, which we are using to this day the same material. And they have the uh, electroplated copper metal. So they had this technology already demonstrated. Um, and then they moved away from it. And they moved over to this idea of taking the printed circuit board that the microprocessor chip sits on. So there's an Intel core sitting on, on a printed circuit board package. And they actually embedded all the inductors as air core inductors into that printed circuit board or that package. So they went completely away from the idea of magnetics to actually using these inductors. And these inductors are air core. So they effectively come for free because you already have this um, printed circuit board package that the Intel core sits on. <clears throat> and we, we have um, spent a lot of time talking with Intel. Um, over, over 20 years or more, we've had some projects with them and so on. We've followed their work very carefully. And they, did, they have done a lot of different things in terms of looking at how could you improve the performance of the inductors. One of the problems with the idea that they had is as, the, um, as you increase the number of cores on your microprocessor chip, that means each core gets smaller and therefore the inductor that's supplying power to that particular core has to get smaller. So that causes a problem then with this idea of embedding air core in the printed circuit board. And so they've looked at lots of different ideas. And one of the most recent ideas they looked at, here is a cross section um, through uh, this package and the processor chip. So the processor chip is sitting up here at the top and there's various um, high density interconnect being used in order to attach it to this organic printed circuit board. And you can see in this printed circuit board, there's copper interconnect on the top here and on the bottom. And in between there are what are called plated through holes. But in this central area here, there's actually only um, organic material, which is part of the uh, substrate of the organic substrate. And what Intel have now looked at doing is, could you use this area in order to actually make your inductors disappear? And so they have moved from this idea of air core inductors to having these vertical copper uh, pillars, let's say, um, in that, in that central uh, core area of the substrate, and they have wrapped magnetic material around that. So you get a vertical inductor. And that's a very interesting idea because now you're getting the maximum density of inductor that you, you would need for when, when more and more cores are used in those uh, microprocessors. So they've used uh, the printed circuit board concept and what's really interesting is we, we have completed a project this year, which was funded by Sons Foundation Ireland to do something similar, but actually do it with, in our silicon fab with our thin film materials that we have been using. So here you have a copper pillar, two copper pillars, and then we have deposited the magnetic material around those copper pillars. So you can get an array of these inductors taking up a very, very small space. So here you have 0.3 millimeter by 0.1 millimeter um, of total uh, footprint 
for this. So that's what is a 0.03 millimeter squared. And that compares with, if you remember the thin filament doctor I, I showed you earlier, it was 0.3 millimeter squared footprint. So these are tiny. And that would really open up the opportunity um, in the future. So we, we are in, in the process of uh, patenting this technology and trying to um, iron out some issues that we have uh, with, the, with the, the overall concept. But if, if we could get this working, then that would be really cool. And I'm just, I'm, that's just an extra uh, version of the same, the same idea. So the challenges that arise um, here, this is a whole new industry. We are creating our supply chain, our ecosystem. So there's a problem as to who should own it. Is it the traditional power supply companies or is it the system design companies or is it um, the semiconductor companies or is it the foundries? And the same question is, where is the supply chain? Who is going to build all of this? And that's what we've spent maybe over 10 years helping the industry to try and sort out where is the supply chain? We believe it's, there are multiple opportunities for this supply chain and therefore multiple opportunities for different companies in the supply chain. The, the computer-aided design is still a problem. There, there, there are issues that when you bring inductors very close to circuits, there may be noise, EMI, um, and, and there are very sensitive circuits in um, processor chips and so on. So there is a need to ensure that this isn't going to be a problem. There's also an issue about what are the standards that need to be put in place in order to ensure that everyone is doing this the same way. And one of the things that we're finding is that, you know, because magnetics has been a pain point, there are less and less people who have an, an understanding and an expertise in magnetics. And that, that's, that's going to potentially be a roadblock in the future if we're not careful. Maybe we will need to get artificial intelligence to take over that whole magnetic space. And I just wanted to come back to acknowledgements. And, you know, really, all I'm doing is standing on the, on the shoulders of giants, of the people who have done this work, of the people who have supported us in doing this work, of the people who have encouraged us, uh, who have challenged us, who have driven us forward, who have introduced us to their companies, um, the, the organizations who have funded us. And you know, without that sort of an ecosystem, but within Tyndall, within UCC, within the Irish electronics industry, within the international electronics industry, within the European um, ecosystem, we could not have been successful. We would not have delivered at this level. Um, and I guess, you know, it's really pleasing to, to be able to have accepted these awards on behalf of everybody and on behalf of Irish research and to, ha to have been part of demonstrating the world leading nature of Irish research, Tyndall research, UCC research. So thank you very much. I hope uh, you're all ready for the exam. Thank you very much, Keen. I don't know where to, I'll take quite a bit, I'll open for questions in a moment, but just say thank you that that was a very interesting and comprehensive overview. Um, two things to say. One is, I like your analogy with George Boole. I don't know if you know why Boole invented um, Boolean logic. Was it to do with, um, it was the, talking to God or trying to figure out what? Well, the other version is that he made a bet with a colleague that he could invent oh. something that was totally useless. <laughs> oh, I love and for, it. And, for, 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 and he won the bet for 50 years, I think. I think oh. you only won the bet for 20 years, Keen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. damn it. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, that was very interesting. Um, very I think great. actually, I mean, there's lots of interesting things in there. Just on your very last slide to note that all of that began with a, a EI funding in 1992 through the uh, Power Electronics PAT. That's correct. As, uh, you know, by, by the way, as did all the work 
in photonics in Tyndall from the photonics part of that time to say that there were some people that back in those days who didn't have an idea probably of just how visionary they were and what they were doing. Yes, indeed. Very yeah. good. good. And I see where Katie said the same about matrices according to Aiden. But I should open up to questions because it's coming up towards 11 and start. John Morris, see you have your hand up. Yeah, can you hear me, Owen? Yes, yes. Okay, Keen, uh, a fantastic presentation of a lot of work done over the years from everybody. Good acknowledgement there. Absolutely groundbreaking stuff. And, and uh, you know, it's going to plow, I'd say, a lot more uh, research and accolades to, I suppose, Tyndall over the next few years. The question I have is Intel. Um, being so advanced back in the, you know, go back a couple of years ago, as you said, right? Um, and then I know how large companies and co or corporations work in terms of politics and business decisions, but where are they today in terms of, I mean, they still have the technology buried somewhere within Intel. Um, what's their story today in terms of, you know, the patents that, Tind that Tyndall have versus the Intel story? Have you got any insight there? Um, so I guess, so first of all, let's say, all, all the people who were working on that magnetics and silicon work back in, in the, the noughties, they, they have all left um, okay. and probably have gone to more than one company. Um, but, you know, I do think that what the, one of the last slides I showed there where they showed this vertical inductor embedded in the um, organic package, that, that idea is actually a very good idea because um, one of the problems with a flat inductor like we were developing, a planar inductor, is you, you have a limited, you, you can't reduce the DC resistance uh, sufficiently. Mm. Whereas when you make a, it vertical, you now have um, a plated through hole construction yeah. or a pillar, and you can get very low DC resistance. And mm. that's what's really cool about that. So, you know, that, that idea and having them move in that direction, it makes an awful lot of sense. I do understand they are looking back at magnetics on silicon as well, but I still think that what they've come up with actually is, it's a really cool idea. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic work. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Okay. If usually in this, we just allow people to come forward with questions rather than raising hands. If anybody has further questions, either raise your hand or just come in as you wish. Okay. I think. I've got another question, Kian. Great, John. <laughs> John. John here again. Come back to my RF and microwave experience. Um, I see, you know, in the plot you show there, the Q of the inductor um, has a limited frequency, I suppose, response. And you're showing responses up to a gigahertz. Maybe that dropped down to about maybe two or three in terms of Q, right? Do you yeah. see any future of the magnetics there in terms of miniaturization that you can shove the Qs up to the well beyond in, into the 10 gigahertz region to kind of use? So you could use these inductors as RF components, because that's a big that's a big issue with, with RF microwave. Again, the inductor, even on chip, is large. Okay. Um, well, in actual fact, uh, John, we, we we have recently spoke with with um, a, a guy uh, from India who went working with one of the the gurus in Japan. Uh, he went working with Masahiro Yamaguchi in Tohoku, and uh, they looked at developing. Um, gigahertz ferrite <laughs> material right mm -hmm. using some special uh, chemical processing uh w with a view to doing what you've just said so it's, it's certainly uh, being looked at here yeah because yeah, i think with the copper pillars uh you definitely are on the right track because that's what we do with within a, a circuit to increase the uh, value of the inductor and even the current density or the saturation current is to put in, you know, these, these copper pillar structures. Yes, um, yes. So I think it's, it's really, yeah, really good. And Keen, Thanks. there's a question in the chat, which is yeah. interesting to know, is there any discussions in relation to potential energy savings for electric vehicles based on similar ideas? 
And I suppose what we what most of what we've done right has been built around the, the microprocessor chip. So if you're going into say electric vehicles where okay you do have a battery uh, but you're you're uh, connecting that to an engine um it is it's a very different can i call it circuit topology and one wouldn't be using the thin film magnetics that we are looking at so one would need to look at other technologies for the inductors that you might use there and we haven't really looked at that in any to any extent. Um, it, it, it's it's like it's a, it's a different parish, I would suggest, right? Okay, so you're not going to be saying hurling with them, thank you. It's a different <laughs> parish. Indeed, indeed. Or you might allow some of your team. You might allow some of your team to go change parish, but anyway. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. so Driscoll actually is is looking. Uh, in, in that battery area, um, but maybe not with the inductors, more with the, the, the power management chips. <clears throat> Great. Okay. I'm conscious, by the way, that it's just coming up to a couple of minutes to 11 and people probably have other engagements at 11. Uh, so just finish up, before finishing up, I'm um, to say, Kian, it's been great to see the numbers here today, 100 at its peak, 74, staying wow. to the very end of the questions. But to remind people that we have Tintle Talks scheduled generally most weeks at this time and the next talk is next Tuesday when Matteo Menelotto will be talking about wearables and robotics so another aspect of the wide range of research that's been carried out in Tyndall uh, with I think high relevance in a lot of different directions so next Tuesday at the same time Matteo Menelotto will be speaking on wearables and robotics um, and if there's any final closing questions or comments um, if not, I, I just want to come. Yeah, great, great work, Ian. Really good. I, I think you know, being able to implement, I guess, um, you know, high Q inductors on chip. Uh, that's that's a real uh, breakthrough because, especially for antennas, if you can make a good inductor on silicon, you can make a good antenna on silicon. Um, they're they're very similar, so I, I think that's very exciting development. Yeah. Very nice, John. We should talk. Yeah. Good. Okay. So thanks again, Kian, for a very comprehensive and a, a clear overview of a very impressive body of work and very nice to see the recognition that you and it and the team have achieved over, well, actually over quite a number of years in fairness, because remember, like Netflix won UCC Research Team of the Year of the order of five or six years ago. That's right. Um, That's so UCC recognizing the work at that stage and has been more widely recognized clearly in the last year. So very nice to see and hoping that it continues to grow in its impact and spawn other ideas as well. So thanks again, Kian. Thank you everybody. Thanks for everybody. Coming. Take care. Appreciate your, the audience. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.